friend Jack Carr and his new book, Only the Dead. And I have it in my hand. This is a, I, I think this is bigger than his other ones. You can tell he got really excited at this point in the story. <laughs> uh, this, I'm very excited to have Jack Carr in studio with us, our second studio guest. And the studio audience goes wild. Hey! Yeah. Look, at Look at that crowd. Look at that crowd. For the studio Amazing. audience. So Jack Carr joins us in studio. Welcome back to Texas. Thank Good to you. see you. Congrats love Texas. on the book. Thank you so much. I love being in the studio. Such an honor to be here. This is really cool. Oh, really cool to come you. behind the scenes and I always love to see you guys. So thank you so much. Well, it's like I said, always good to have you. And this, this is, is this, am I crazy in thinking that this is longer than your other ones? It's the longest so far. So I didn't start out that with that in mind, but it, for me, it's all about the story. So it doesn't yeah. matter how long it is. And usually these books are a little over 100,000 words and I blew right past that, right by 110, 120, 130. So this is about 139,000 words. And for me, I don't get to 100 and say, well, it's about time to start wrapping this up because that's yeah. where these things should be and I'm coming up on a deadline. For me, it's all about that story. And this one took 139,000 words uh, to get it where it needed to be. And it's also the most brutal to date. So really? there's that. Yeah. And that's saying something if people have read my, my yeah. other ones, but for sure the most brutal and the thickest. So you can use it as a blunt impact weapon or a doorstop mm. if you need to. Well, it's great. And if people are unfamiliar, which I don't know how you would be with our good friend, Jack Carr, uh, Navy sniper, New York Times bestselling author. I know you've watched his series, The Terminalist on Amazon Prime starring Chris Pratt, which was so good. Thank you. And I know you were very excited. You were very well behaved and tight lipped about it as you should be because <laughs> you can only say certain things when you can say them. Um, but I know that there's going to be a second season that was already announced. Second season announced and a spinoff announced as well. So a spinoff uh, with the character Ben Edwards yes. played by Taylor Kitsch, who was a Texas forever mm -hmm. out here for yet yeah, number 33 yep. um, on Friday Night Lights. And Taylor is just Amazing. It's one of the characters that I think was more fully developed on the page for the script than in my first novel. And then Taylor just brought it to a whole nother level. And when we saw him and Chris Pratt do their screen test together, it was like, this person is Ben Edwards 100%. Yes, yes. He crushed it. And so we thought, well, at the end, it might be a spoiler alert. So earmuffs for everyone who hasn't uh, yeah. read the book or watched the show, but uh, he has a there's ending. A, mm, it would, a, he wouldn't continue on. Let's say, say that. So we went back and did a pre, it's a prequel mm -hmm. origin story. So more of an international espionage story that shows how he goes from the SEAL teams to the CIA. Mm -hmm. And uh, instead of revenge thriller, conspiracy thriller, action thriller, like the Terminalist, it's one goes international and it, I am fired up. It is really good. It's on, on pause right now because of the writer strike. Right. So we're about, and writing wise, we're about episode five. I was five. getting ready to ask you um, about that. Yeah. So it's, uh, so it'll push things to the right a little bit probably. But uh, <laughs> once we dive back into it, then, uh, then we'll start filming whenever we, whenever we can and knock this thing out of the park and then roll right that, that one right into True Believer, which is mm -hmm. my second novel starring Chris Pratt. And Chris will be in a few of the episodes yeah. of the spinoff as well. The, the casting for this, and we're talking with our friend Jack Carr, who's in studio with us. And you can also check out his Danger Close podcast in addition to all of his best-selling books the I know you were involved in some of the casting I or at least you could influence some of it because when you mentioned Taylor Kitsch when I first heard that he was going to be cast in this I thought this is going to be interesting because that is such the the Ben is such a I don't want to say convoluted but he's a, a difficult character mm -hmm. he's a very different it doesn't seem that way initially but he's a very difficult character mm -hmm. and it's very hard to get to like someone and then you're I don't want to give anything, but you're not going to like him. I'll put right, it like that. Right. He does it very he, well, though. He's he can pull a very, it off. He's very amiable. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And people already like him as a person, and so he brings that with him yeah. to to this role anyway. Same with Chris. You yes. Wanna, you want to like this person? He might do some well, things on screen. He was in the Mario screen. movie. If you're crying out loud. <laughs> exactly. You can't hit a guy. He was in the Mario <laughs> exactly. movie. Exactly. How that's not possible. So he brings this to to the role anyway for an audience that might need to forgive him uh, for doing a couple of things because it is violent, it is visceral, it is primal, it is rooted in the realities of modern combat uh, and it's a revenge thriller from uh, with someone who has nothing left to lose so uh, same thing with Taylor even though people know how he ends up in the terminal list going back Taylor just being who he is and what he brings to the role uh, and the story now mm -hmm. itself now that we've written it out is it, it's he can pull it off people will be on board even though they know in the back of their head where it's gonna end up down the line I think that they'll be 100% on board really because it's it's Taylor and because these scripts are so good I'm very excited about it and I you've I mean you keep every every time you come out with a book you're already writing your next thing oh, yeah. 
So yeah, I know that you have the spinoff. You 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 also have targeted a series that's coming. Tell tell me about this that's as right. well. That's right. That's right. So I always wanted to do nonfiction, but mm -hmm. not the here's why time in the SEAL teams. Exactly. There's, there's plenty of that out there, and people did so much more than I could ever have hoped to have done in the military. Nobody so, actually knows the extent of what you've done. I have to say, you I are very mysterious. <laughs> which is, I mean, I know that I understand how it works, but there's there's you know, I you, everyone yeah. is always so humble, you included. Yeah. I uh, had a good run, and uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, it I had was, a good run. So uh, it was all due timing. Right. A lot of that's timing, but uh, I get to take those emotions and feelings and mm -hmm. apply them to a totally fictional narrative. So for me, I'm kind of writing about the things that I did, but not actually what I did, but the feelings and emotions behind what it was like to be in an ambush in Baghdad in 2006, yeah. or what it was like to be a sniper in Ramadi at the height of the war. But I bring those to completely fictional narratives to bring those feelings and emotions to life. You do a very good job of that. Thank you. Because, you, I mean, it's things that most people, unless they've been in that position, they can't even remotely imagine. And so I don't have to go out there and like interview somebody who was a sniper and then have their answers get filtered through other interviews that I've done, other research that I've done, documentaries, movies, books I've read. It all comes from my heart and soul right onto that page. So if, if the feelings and emotions feel real to the reader, that's because they are. And my plan was always to write nonfiction eventually. And I always wanted to go in and study these different terrorist events that were very impactful to me mm -hmm. as a kid. So uh, it just made sense to start with the 1983 Beirut barracks bombing because I remember that cover of Newsweek and the cover of Time Magazine and, and our local paper. And well. I write on Instagram and I put those out there in history posts because I want to keep those alive so that we don't make those same mistakes going forward. So in that particular instance, there's a, a lead up to that event. So April 83, there's the United States Embassy is bombed in Beirut, Lebanon. And then there's some newly declassified documents from the Reagan administration that talk about who was uh, wanted to put Marines ashore in Beirut, who wanted to keep them on amphib ships in the Mediterranean, and how that decision was made. And that leads into the October bombing, which has the, uh, the largest number of Marines killed in a single day since World War II, since Iwo Jima. And then there's an ending to it as well. The person who planned that attack is killed in 2008 in Damascus, Syria. And he's killed him. It was probably a joint Mossad CIA operation, though neither intelligence agency has ever claimed responsibility. Mm. But he's in Damascus, Syria, 2008, gets behind the wheel of his car, and his headrest explodes. I probably shouldn't do th if people don't I know this, I should probably wait till the book. Uh, no, till, no, till tell the us book. more. But tell there's, us uh, more. <laughs> so there's an investigative journalism side to it as well. Yeah. So, and I'm writing that with an historian and Pulitzer Prize finalist, James Scott, who writes primarily about World War II. Uh, an amazing guy. So that's coming out in about a year and a half. So much of, we're talking with our friend Jack Carr, so much of, of what you do is ripped from the headlines. And it's, it's very familiar. And I think it, it's, it makes it very current, but it also makes me wonder because he puts out the best boxes. I have this huge box here behind me. I feel like it should have included a tinfoil hat though, <laughs> because some of the stuff you read it and you think, okay, yeah, I know what was happening when this was written. I know what was going on when this was written. And you, I know a lot of people ask you for your thoughts and your positions mm -hmm. on all these different issues. You, you, you kind of, I mean, if they read your books, you kind of put it in there. I do, and I always thought it was interesting. Not very subtly. That, no, not very subtly, <laughs> because I thought if you're getting in the mind of a character and you're seeing this situation through, in this case, his eyes, um, I want to know the other things that he's thinking about. Right. So if my character is, let's say, on the road in Northern Virginia and takes an exit and goes into Washington, D.C. for a couple minutes before he can circle back around, he's going to think about being a felon for a couple minutes mm -hmm. because he's got this pistol on him or whatever it might be. Other authors might not think of that or other maybe publishers uh, don't necessarily want the protagonist to alienate anybody or any segment of the audience but for me that's not a concern at all because it's all about this story and it's very natural for someone in this position James Reese mm -hmm. my protagonist to think about those things mm -hmm. um, and it would be unnatural for someone with his background not to think about those types of things. So for me, it comes very naturally to put his worldview and his evolution as a person, as an operator, as a leader, uh, as a citizen, seeing things changing uh, in, uh, in his own country. And he asked those questions, is it worth still fighting for this country? Uh, what if I need this country in order to do something like I need to do in these novels, which is either get revenge or whatever it, it might be? Uh, will you have to rely on this entity that might not have the citizen's right. best interests at heart? So I explore all of those in the in these pages of these novels. I mean, wokery does not even escape you. The wokery in the military does not escape you. <laughs> I mean, you even, you even touch on AI. I read an interview that you gave recently where you were talking about AI, and I, I had the quote that you had. I thought it was very... Uh, 
you said as a society we've shown a propensity towards using new tools for what most would term evil, the manipulation of thoughts and behaviors to reach a desired end for a particular group or entity. I mean, it is a tool, it's but a tool. I do worry about the degradation of morality and how that's affected every aspect of everything in America and how that, how, I mean, how do you deal with implementing AI or relying on right. tech like that, considering that? And now it's not even a question of uh, could we or should we? Exactly. It's here. It's exactly. Here. And it's accelerating and moving into our lives faster than we ever uh, were conceived of in years prior. And the first, this writer strike that we just talked about, a lot of that is about AI. Mm. At first, it was going to be about streaming and the changes that have happened over the last decade when it comes to series television and streaming services. And now, with the advent of AI becoming such a big part of our lives, now a lot of these talks are about this AI and how is that going to affect writers in Hollywood. Uh, and I think this is going to be the first time that we're going to see a union get together uh, to to deal with this issue. And I think we're going to see it in a lot of other industries going forward as well, everything from uh, truck drivers to every segment of society, because AI can take a lot of these jobs. And in this book, there's a thing mm -hmm. that we talk about that is, um, I had Brian Moore on the podcast, who wrote a book called The yeah. Able Archers, about a situation in 1983 where we almost had that a was nuclear a very, exchange. I listened, that was a very good interview. Oh, thank you, thank you. And it's, uh, so if that person who was on watch in the Soviet Union mm -hmm. in 1983 had been AI because protocols in place right. and top-down pressure, dictated that this person should have launched against the United States because there was a launch from the United States against the Soviet Union, but it wasn't real. But their computers were showing that it was real. And this one person happened to be on watch because the person who was supposed to be there was sick. So this one person was in there who had studied the United States, studied the Soviet Union, and thought, you know what, this is not real. This can't be real. He didn't launch. He's probably the one person in the Soviet Union that could have been in that seat that instinct. wouldn't have done it. And he had a, he, he had a, a bad ending later on but um, because of that event, because he didn't follow orders, essentially. But imagine if that was AI. That was the point. Imagine if that was AI that sees this launch, it's a glitch, and what would they do? They're not going to be that human element there exactly. to say, wait a second, and now we have a nuclear winner. Exactly. That's such a great point, talking to our friend Jack Carr. You know, I, I have to ask you this as well, because, you know, you... you you touch on in you know in your series the i don't want to give anything away uh betrayals things that are certain government entities are doing that they shouldn't be doing that we end up finding things out about and like it, it does make you very because you you see this in headlines today and then you read about this very personalized account with mm -hmm. your protagonist james reese yeah. i look back at i i, I gotta ask you this question about this because i see uh I don't know if you want to call it a psyop or whatever it is. I see this group. Kane and I were talking about this the other day. The Patriot Front. Joe Biden went out and gave a a, a speech at a historically black university, and I mean it was very interestingly timed. It seems like that group only comes out when he's giving a speech or making remarks. And I've never seen people arrested before, you know, at a protest, and they were allowed to keep their disguises on, their neck hmm. gaiters and their hats and their sunglasses, and uh, they were all arrested and they were all they very similarly proportioned and wearing the same outfits and you know we joke about it but then you know you go to an escape and you're reading your book and you're like <laughs> you know what this is true it can totally happen I'm just like curious as to your thoughts on all that yeah well specifically if we go back to the pages of history I like to go back to the pages of history because usually there are clues there and uh, for one reason or another we neglect to go back in those pages and mm -hmm. take those lessons and apply them going forward as wisdom so if we did we would find that this is a technique uh, that has been used over and over again in order to, to instigate, to get to a desired end state. So for me, it's always about asking who's manipulating me and why, uh, and I think that's the, the case here. But we can also, when we talk about these institutions in our federal government that uh, uh, stray from their mandates, we can go back to the church hearings and the Pike hearings of the mm -hmm. 70s, and after that there was a reorganization of the CIA. But to think that they wouldn't go back to some of the things that they typically were doing in the 50s and 60s and the early 70s uh, and not do those same sorts of things today just because we were reorganized when this government has gotten so much more powerful over the last of the preceding 20, mm -hmm. 30, 40 years. Um, well, maybe we should spend a little more time in the pages though with these history books, take those lessons and apply them to current situations. And because uh, really we're not making these decisions for, for us, it's for our, for our kids, for our, our, uh, our kids and our grandkids going forward. And the answers are out there That's in true. the pages of history. They are. Our friend Jack Carr, and you can always tell, you can kind of get the only 
The only tell that he has about how he feels about something is his voice will drop <laughs> ever so slightly, just a bit. Otherwise, you can't tell. You have no idea. <laughs> oh, you can't know. The book, Only the Dead, by our good friend Jack Carr. Congratulations on all of your successes. I cannot wait to watch the latest series Ooh. of Terminalist. Yeah. Can't wait to watch Targeted. I can't wait to watch the spinoff, All About Ben, which is starring Taylor Kitsch. I can't wait. I'm so excited, and I'm so happy to see someone who's so reasoned and well-written and well-spoken doing so good. Oh, so congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining me in studio. Thank you for having me. This is amazing, and thank you for all you have done and continue to do for freedom. Of course. I appreciate it. <laughs>